All right, one more thing I wanted to mention, folks, uh, and I had a whole bunch of stuff I was going to bring and forgot them. Uh, Extended Studies also offers a, a great series of classes called Western Wednesday. And some of you have been in my class, and I, it's online. But every Wednesday, starting in early June all the way through August, they've got great stuff like hikes and history and geology and art and so on. And I've got one uh, that's going to be starting in Almont for breakfast, and we ride up to Crested Butte with Pete Dunda and the accordion, come back down to the museum and finish off in Taylor Park. That's on July 1, and then July 22, we got one that goes to Sargent's over Monarch Pass, down into Salida, through all the towns like Monarch and Garfield. Pete again playing the polka at the Garfield School, playing the polka at the Sargent School, playing the polka on top of Monarch Pass, playing the polka on top of Marshall Pass. We had a lady last year that was in a vehicle on top of Monarch Pass, and we're dancing right on top of the pass. And Lady looks out and says, what's going on? I said, ma'am, let me grab you here and do the polka. And the guy took right off. <laughs> Probably figured we were all crazy dancing out there. Um, I also have, I want to put a little plug in for a San Juan class that I teach every year from June 21st to the 25th, full up this year. But it's a terrific class. We go out and we stay one night in Uray, one night in Calluride, one night in Silverton, one night in Durango riding the train, walking uh, for those who want to walk over a pass, going to the museums, and it's really a great class. Um, what I want to do today, and I did want to mention one other book that I was going to bring. It's called The Great Divide by Gary Ferguson. And there's a couple chapters in there about Crested Butte. One of them is called uh, The Freaks, I think, and it's about the change from the old timers to the new timers. And it's when Bill Crank got elected mayor. And it's all on Crested Butte. And it's the last two chapters of the book by Gary Ferguson called The Great Divide. So if you have a chance to uh, do that, do it. 7.30 tomorrow night for anybody who's interested, and you're all in Crested Butte and may not be, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Pete Dunda is giving a concert at the Episcopalian Church at 7.30 tomorrow night in Gunnison. And Pete plays classical music. So if anybody is down in Gunnison, wants to stop by, it's free, and with refreshments, 7.30 tomorrow evening. Um, today, before I get the uh, big four on the docket here, I want to start off by kind of finishing off a lecture that I left off with last time on a sustainability. But I did want to say a couple of things about Crested Butte first. I came into this area in 1962, and a lot of you people probably take this kind of stuff for granted. When I came here, I didn't take anything for granted. I knew after the first week that it was going to be my great good fortune to be here, hopefully, for a long time, and I have. And I'm going to read you a, a couple of paragraphs from David Lavender's Rocky Mountain Fantasy, which I think tells about how we feel about Crested Butte. David Lavender was the greatest historian of the West, and Theodora Kreiber was the world's greatest anthropologist who wrote the book on Ishi, the last surviving Indian in California. They both grew up in Telluride, or near Telluride, in the Lone Cone country. And they got together when they were old in the early eight, 1970s, and Theodora Kreiber said this to David Lavender. In that thin, dry air, life moved at a pace of almost terrible intensity. There were no neutral moments, the galloping brevity of spring and summer, the long months of winter, with the threat of tragedy always hovering near. Colors were high, the reds in the soil, the fall gold of the aspen, the indescribable sky. Riding in summer and tobogganing in winter were fast and dangerous. The heights of the mountains and the depths of the canyons were beyond the human norm. One went about totally sensitized. No wonder recovery for the elders was a trip to the coast. And for a youngster, introversion. Get on your horse and ride until you looked out and down, tremendously out and down. 
God was a pagan God in the air, over the mountains, in the waterfalls, but how can I give the feeling tone of my childhood in that high alpine valley, which simply is one of the most beautiful spots in the world? So all of you and me now are very privileged to live in an area like this. Not very many people in the world have the opportunity to live here. A lot of the things that we take for granted, you know, the great ethnic heritage that we have, the tremendous snow, the Elk Mountains, the ranching history, all of that, I hope you never take it for granted. I hope you never, I mean, you see these kids come into the library and look out through the window. I don't know how I could have studied <laughs> looking out through the window. So enough. I think I started in sustainability, and if the big four will pardon me for about uh, seven minutes here, I want to finish that up. We talked about sustainability last time. I told all of you that before the railroads came to the Gunnison country, this area had to be sustainable. Nobody's going to city market. Nobody's going to the uh, Safeway to stock up. Immediately, meat and milk were here. Cows were already brought in in the late 1860s. Immediately, creamery sprang up. The Gunnison Creamery in Gunnison, the Howville Creamery in Jack's Cabin, and the Castleton Creamery up Ohio Creek. So now you had cream, cheese, and butter. And every cattleman usually made his own butter. So you're sustainable in these areas. In addition, and here's a great trivia question I always ask my classes, the number one trading commodity, and I think I told you this last time, are spices because it is a preservative worth more than gold. Before refrigeration, you had to have ice. And everybody, almost all the ranchers, were alongside a river, and they cut their own ice. That's how they stored stuff in the winter. In Gunnison, they had a five-acre pond south and west of town. They produced 25,000 tons of ice every year, selling 10,000 to the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. And they made a lot of money, the Gunnison Ice Company. One of the re uh, reports in the newspaper said, most of our ranchmen are located near a stream from which it is a short, cheap job to fill individual ice houses for summer comfort and profit. Many city businessmen in Gunnison, Pitkin, Crested Butte, and smaller towns have their own houses. Fish. North of Gunnison, by about one mile, they had a huge fish pond owned by a guy named George Anderson, and he had lights up above the pond, and the insects would come in in the lights, and the fish would be jumping out of the water eating the insects. Right out here at the base of Crested Butte Mountain, where the golf course is, they had the Hillside Ranch. And a guy named Harold Decker had a big pond right out there, and he sold 2,000 pounds of fish at 30 cents a pound every year, right from that pond. Now, obviously, people caught fish in the river on their own, but I mean, this is commercial stuff. So now you got fish. Meat markets. The big meat market in Gunnison is located, in Crested Butte, was located right near the grub stake by a man named Joe Block, B L O C H. The big one in Gunnison is located on the stoplight corner, Main and Tamichi, where a guy named Charlie Stevens had a 100-foot square corral, and in the early days, 50 to 100 people, he said, would line up in the morning at 9 o'clock waiting for the meat cutters to cut meat for them. So now you got butchers cutting meat for you. Meat market's very big. Potatoes became very big. One of the great potato men, if you go to Lost Canyon, right where you pass Lost Canyon, left side of the road going to Gunnison, a family named Haymaker pumped water 75 feet from the Gunnison River onto a mesa and raised 200 acres of potatoes and raised so many potatoes that the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad put a spur in there and they called it Hay Spur. You had another guy named Major five miles up the Taylor River 
raised 20,000 pounds of potatoes one year and had a guy in a powder horn named Potato Henry Rudolph who raised potatoes 200 pounds to the acre. So now we got potatoes. One of the other things that we produced very early, and the potatoes incidentally died out about the 1920s because everybody began to raise them and the price went down. So they stopped raising them. And then you had grain. A guy named Matt Arge brought a six-horse threshing machine in here in 1885, east of Gunnison. Another guy brought a 10-horse threshing machine in about 10 years later. 20,000 bushels of oats and 4,000 bushels of barley, which immediately were sold to what? The Gunnison Brewery and the Guthel Brewery for a very good amount of money. They do it in the San Luis Valley today for Coors, special brand of barley. So now you got hops for the beer. And everybody certainly at Crested Butte was interested in that. The one man, however, who is most responsible for agriculture in the Gunnison country is a guy by the name of Harry Cornwall Sr. He was from New York. His sons, Harry and George, were in Irwin when the mining boom occurred, made a lot of money, lost all the money, and then they bought a ranch up Ohio Creek, about two miles south of Castleton. And Harry Cornwall decided he's going to put a garden in. And every rancher said, you're crazier than hell. We got a 70-day growing season out. You don't know anything. They laughed at him. But Harry Cornwall decided that he was from New York, and hell, he thought he could put a garden in. Nobody had ever done that. So I'm quoting now from Harry Cornwall Jr.'s memoir of what happened. After sarcastic and hilarious prophecies, the garden was started. The results were stunning. Folks came from 20 miles away to see our garden before they would believe its success. Father raised potatoes as big as eggplant, peas, beans, lettuce, and all vegetables except corn, pumpkins, squash, and cucumbers which could, could not develop because of the cold nights. The next year, he started the Gunnison Agricultural Fair which later on became known as the Gunnison Cattlemen's Days. And I always tell my classes when I talk about what Leonardo da Vinci was great in, or Aristotle was great in, I say to them, I'm going to take a deep breath right now, and I'm going to see if I can get all these subjects out in one breath. So here are the products, agricultural produce raised successfully in the Gunnison country in the 1880s. And I'm taking a deep breath. Two breaths. <laughs> Potatoes, beets, turnips, carrots, oats, rye, timothy, onions, parsnips, beans, cabbage, lettuce, cauliflower, celery, radishes, butter, artichokes, currants, tomatoes, watermelons. Ranchers came from 20 miles away. Couldn't believe it. And from that time on, ladies and gentlemen, every rancher had a garden. And we can do it today. We can do it today. I'll talk more about that in a moment. About 20 years ago, I'm giving a talk to the Gunnison stock growers, and I show them a slide of a machine out by sergeants with two people on the machine. And I said, if anybody can tell me what this machine is, I'd buy them two six-packs of Heineken's. I said, George Means can't answer. Because George Means was from the upper Tamich, and I knew he knew. 8,477 feet planting strawberries. Successfully, big. And Will Hicks took him into Gunnison, but he never, Will told me, he never got to Gunnison. Because he rode the train and he sold out before he got to Gunnison. Fresh strawberries, ladies and gentlemen. Raspberries right on Gunsight Pass. I picked them. My mother and I used to pick them and she'd can them. Strawberry, raspberry, shortcake, etc. Ed McGuffey had a ranch and a farm seven miles east of Gunnison and in 1933 had a mushroom farm. Commercial mushrooms. Hay, 
80,000 tons in, in 1910. 40,000 went out of here at 100 bucks a ton. Now, a lot of areas in Colorado didn't have the irrigation water that we have, so whenever a dry year came, the ranchers made out like bandits by selling hay. 100 bucks a ton in the 1880s, 90s, 1900. Hell, I don't know what that's worth today. Same today. <laughs> yeah, same today. Bucks. Yeah. But it meant 100 bucks. Unbelievable. So, one more thing. Turkeys, chickens, etc., fresh eggs, fresh chicken. When I was on the farm, my grandfather used to shoot their heads off with a 410 shotgun. After he left, I chopped their heads off on a chopping block and watched my cousins go absolutely crazy as they watched that chicken scamper around for one minute without a head. Now, the $64 question is, can we do it today? Can we have agriculture today? And the, the answer is absolutely yes. We got the water. We got the sunshine. We got a long enough growing season. And we got a little more science than we had at that time. That's it. I now sit down and shut up. And uh, we got all the people together here. We got, uh, let me introduce them. You guys, I think, know them. Jim Schmitz on the, the Crest of Butte City Council. Wave your hand, Jim. I think everybody knows you. Chris Ladoulis on the Crest of Butte City Council. Joe Fitzpatrick, the mayor of Mount Crested Butte. Town manager of Mount Crested Butte. And uh, John Norton used to be the CEO at Aspen, CEO of Crested Butte Ski Areas, and now the head of the Tourist Association. And we have a Q&A session going on right now. And I got questions also, and you can direct them to anybody you want. Who is going to kick it off? Let's see your hands, and let's not be shy. Let's get a hand up here right now. Glow. Hey, um, Chris. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, you are the newest member of the town council, and so the least person that's been around the town council. What do you think are some of the biggest challenges for the town council that you see today? Wow. <laughs> With the bang. Um, you know, that is a great question. So I've seen a lot of change in Crested Butte since I arrived 15 years ago, and I think it's been pretty dramatic. So when I think about what those have seen before me, what I've seen just in my short time here, because I'm almost a local now, um, that I do think that the change coming is one of the, is in total a pretty significant challenge for us. It's not one thing in particular, but it's, it's the variety and the sheer volume of change that may be coming our way and how we deal with it. And so in my first year of uh, being on council in Crested Butte, I've seen the conversation and the reality of people dealing with housing issues and real estate prices and uh, just coming out of a difficult recession um, and then trying to imagine what it's, what it's going to be like five years from now. And uh, I'm not sure that we know the answers to a lot of those things, but I'd say that's probably one of the big ones. And all the while in the middle of this change, trying to preserve what we have and the community that's been really strong and gone through a lot of tough times and uh, hoping that we preserve as much of it as possible. Good so. answer. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I got a question for John Norton. Uh, John, you've been a CEO at, a at Aspen and Crested Butte. Uh, what would you do if you were the CEO of the Crested Butte ski area to increase skier days and perhaps make it a better product? Okay, everybody should understand, in the last 20 years, CBMR has lost more skier days, our community has lost more skier days than any other place in North America. When I got back here, a lot of people would say to me, boy, the ski industry is in the tank. And I said, the ski industry has never been bigger or healthier. What's in the tank is Crested Butte, and that remains true today. We peaked in the 90s 
at 550,000 skier days, and I haven't seen numbers from this year. I imagine they'll be reported at some point. My guess is it's going to be in the neighborhood of 350,000 skier days, which is not a sustainable number over many years. And this was a good year compared to last year, at least in terms of skier volume. Uh, ski areas eat capital for breakfast. Uh, capital comes in uh, uh, two tranches. One is recurring capital, okay? And recurring capital is what we do to our house on an annual basis to keep it in shape. So the shingles on the roof are faulty and we have to repair our roof. We have to cut our grass. Uh, we have to paint the siding. Plumbing broke and we fixed it. And then there is extraordinary capital, and that is capital that has some kind of sex appeal in the skier market. And, you know, in the 11 years of the Muller's ownership, we have seen in the extraordinary capital bucket uh, one new East River lift, which is a very nice lift, and one new restaurant which is a very nice restaurant, Yuli's in the Ice Bar. But that is not keeping up with other ski areas in a very competitive market. And so for the ski area to regain its oomph, there needs to be a pretty big capital spend. Okay, an attempt was made on Snodgrass. Uh, that proved uh, an investment that the ski area was willing to make and there was not an opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity now, I think, in terms of community sentiment for Tia Kali II, uh, and we'll see if that gets off the ground. But the product over time is remaining uncompetitive. The biggest problem is that uh, guests don't return at a rate necessary to build a business. So lots of people come for the first time, and lots of people do not come back uh, because of the dearth of intermediate skiing, primarily. Anybody who runs a business, Chris would be one, uh, if you're serving food that people don't like and people don't come back to your restaurant, you change something until you get it right, and then you make the play. And so uh, we need capital spending. Any skier does. And if you look at the the iconic resorts in the Rocky Mountains on the spine and the hard to get to uh, places, which are all in my mind gorgeous, Taos, Telluride, Us, Aspen, Sun Valley, Jackson. These are all places that are fabulous and all are very much on uh, their feet, except for us. Uh, I get a, a pretty good view of this uh, from the uh, Tourism Association uh, standpoint where we uh, compare our statistics with 18 other resorts that are uh, in mountain valleys from New Mexico all the way up to Wyoming. You know, in February and March of this year, we ran the very lowest uh, rates for rooms of any resort, and we also ran just about the lowest uh, occupancy percentages. And so this is a, a multiplier and a multiple can that just don't fit. We can't sell our rooms, and we're, those that we are selling are at the lowest rates in the Rocky Mountains. And so um, I think that answers your question. We need capital spending. I, I think, by the way, uh, th this is not a condemnation of the personnel at CBMR. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, Scott Clarkson has tapped into the Denver market in a way that I never figured out how to. And so we see Denver people. Uh, but uh, you can only do so well without a competitive product in the market. And that's where we are. We find ourselves now, those of you who like to ski the steeps, it's been two years now of very late or no openings of the steeps. That's an expensive thing to do. But we need to do it because it's the one product in our mix 
that's actually quite extraordinary. And so, that's what needs to be done. You know, we talk about summer being so strong, and I think summer is only strong in comparison to our winter, which has declined so greatly. You know, it, it, you know winter used to be carry the day. Aspen has the strongest summer in the world, and winter is still king. Sales tax revenues in Aspen go December, March, February, January, July, August. That's the ranking. In your opinion, where does Aaron fit into this equation? Well, that's a chicken and the egg question. He, uh, Rick asked about air service. And so we've got a terrible schedule right now, right? 4.30, one flight a day. You want to go to New York? You fly out of Gunnison. You go somewhere on Tower Road to spend the night, and you catch a flight to LaGuardia in the morning. I mean, it just doesn't work. And so the RTA and CBMR went to United and said, geez, we only have one flight. At least make it the overnighter that people seem to, or a midday flight that connects to either coast. And United's answer was, you don't matter. You're our least important airport in the mountains, and you are going to get the war service. And at least they were honest about it. It's a, it's a good thing to hear. I mean, honestly, to have someone just say, you don't get good service because you don't deserve good service because no one wants to fly to you and your community is not large enough to support much service outbound. Okay, now, in 1985 through 91, 92, we had air service that was second only to Aspen. You know, Joe remembers that. Jim Schmidt remembers that. Some of you will remember that. Only second to Aspen. We have lost 75% of our air service. Okay, so if we had more air service, would we have more skier days and more tourism? Absolutely. But when we go to United or American and say, give us more, they say, will you please prove up some demand? We'd be happy. We're in the business of selling seats. If we thought anyone wanted to buy any in Gunnison, we'd give you more. But if it's between an extra flight to Crested Butte or an extra flight to Aspen or Steamboat or Sun Valley or Jackson Hole or Montrose or Telluride, or Eagle, you're not going to get it because you're not a player anymore. It's heartbreaking to me. It's very sad. And we're not going to get that service back. The airport, if it takes one step backwards, it's going to lose a million dollars in FAA funding, and then we are truly in a death spiral. We are right on that edge now. I flew in the other day. I went to Omaha last week. I had to be there on Tuesday from 11 in the morning till 2. That's all I had to be there for. And I'm trying to support the airport, so I flew out on Monday, and I flew back on Wednesday for a three-hour meeting. Okay, I'm not complaining about that. But on the flight I flew in, there were 10 people on a 50-seat jet doesn't cut it. It does not cut it. We used to fill the planes. And we didn't have a bad year this year in terms of filling the planes. And we may get a little more service next year, but we are on the edge. And it's like a cold shower when we go and talk to the airlines because we're, we're like a gnat that, that they have to pay a little bit of attention to, but we're really not important anymore. Consolidation that changed since 91? <coughs> what changed? Because you said 85 to 91 is great. Well, okay, so, um, so in the winter, 
And, and you know, the summer guy is still pretty much a fly, uh, drive guy. Okay, get in your car and you drive. So that's why there's so much less air service in the summer here and in Aspen and in Hayden and in Jackson and everywhere else. Um, are, are products less competitive than it used to be? Uh, you know, if what, what this community, I mean, Chris hit a, a little bit here. We want to preserve the important things, but there are going to be some things that change. We've never discussed the risk of the status quo. We act like the status quo will get us the same results in the future that we have gotten in the past. That's nonsense. Okay? That's just not going to happen. And so we relate to the game in high-speed lifts. We still have a dearth of intermediate skiing. Other people have put more product on. People have beat us around the ears in expert skiing, and they get that expert terrain open. Other mountain airports have opened. There's more demand for those. Our air service used to be a relative advantage. Now it's a relative disadvantage. You know, if we're going to freeze this valley in amber and expect to get the same results that we did in 85 through 91, we are insane. We are not thinking clearly. I'm not saying this is not a charming place to live, but at this point, I think there's something like 35 or 40 percent of the kids in our school district are on free lunch. Okay, we all sit here pretty comfortable. You know, I had smoked oysters for dinner. That was nice. And a glass of wine. 40 percent. We have 250 kids in partners. That's the youth mentoring program in the Valley. You know, 10 years ago, there were 20. The world is changing, and we either decide, we need to decide at some point, are we going to stay in the ski business, or are we going to leave the ski business? Okay, that, that should be a conscious decision. That shouldn't be something that befalls us. Oh, we really weren't paying attention. We have to decide whether we want an airport or if we don't care. Ethan Muller brought up a good question. I think it was a year or two ago. Should we give up on Gunnison and move to Montrose? There's a strong argument for closing the Gunnison Airport. If we and Telluride put our weight behind Montrose, the service there would get that much better. And we're no farther from Montrose than Telluride is. But there was a lot of shock and awe in the community that anybody would ever suggest that. Ethan's just looking at the numbers. And he said, the direction we're going, we're not going to have an airport, and rather have than have not an airport happen to us, I'd rather actually take a proactive step and ensure that we have ground transportation to Montrose and can work something with Telluride on a collaborative basis and get lower fares because we've got more service and have more frequent service. And people were horrified. And they say, no, we want this airport. Well, if we want an airport, we have to make it work. But like you've already mentioned, which comes first? I mean, we are being forced into the Montrose option because the service is so far out of Gunnison. So do you fix the service, which United doesn't want to do, into Gunnison and give us a viable option? Even a midday flight is absurd for connecting, you know? And so um, we're constantly on the road between Montrose and Denver. I hate it. I hate that we're having to go to Montrose to get air I hate it. I, I go to Denver when I don't think Gunnison's going to work. And I was in a cold sweat last week because if the Gunnison flight didn't fly, I wasn't going to make it to Omaha. And so not only was I going to take three days of travel for a three-hour meeting, if the first flight didn't fly, I was completely hosed. I was thinking, how long does it take to drive to Omaha because there were no morning flights out of Denver, even if I... Anyway, uh, the chicken or the egg. The solution to the airport is, is twofold. One, you need more people to demand flying here. Okay, if we get our occupancies or our uh, uh, 
load factors into the 70s or the high 70s, we're going to get more service. And then if people like you and like me who travel for their business see that we have a good enough air service, then this becomes an option to live in this valley and to use the service. Now, okay, you're a consultant and you're, you want to live in the mountains and you can. Dwayne said at the beginning, aren't we so lucky to live here? Yes, we are. So I can actually carry out my consultancy and live in the mountains and boy, do I want to do that. So where am I going to live? So I look at Jackson Hole, Sun Valley, Hayden, Aspen, Eagle, Telluride, Montrose. And I look at those air schedules and I say, that can work. And I look at Gunnison's and I said, that's not going to work at all. Because it's a disaster when there's one flight a day and that flight doesn't go. And so we're, we're not going to get the people to move here to support the outbound and inbound travel until we build the, the tourism market to a point where there are more flights and then someone that's thinking about moving here would actually do that because we offer them the flexibility of travel that they need to carry out their career. But we're, but we're not going to get more seats until we get more demand. The airlines have told us they will, they will put on more flights when more people want to fly here. But just a few people here and there moving to the valley and wanting to fly out is not going to provide the demand necessary to fill those flights. Uh, I'll start it off and then we get a few more questions maybe. Joe, uh, Crested Butte, Mount Crested Butte, uh, what do you see as the uh, status between the two right now? Are we ever going to get together on things like convention centers and Fourth of July celebrations and that type of thing. What is the relationship between the two? Where do you see that going? Well, first of all, I've had been here long enough that I've had the experience uh, back when the airplanes were fuller and we began the air service in the mid 80s. Uh, Mickey Cooper was the mayor downtown and I was the mayor on the mountain. We created the Mayor Brothers. We traveled from one end of this country to the other, selling this place, and we helped fill those airplanes. Uh, that was a fun, interesting era. Well, politics change, town councils change, the communities change, and we bounced along and didn't work together as much anymore. I think right now we're in a pretty good place where we are working together. We definitely have our differences. We've had our differences for a long time. Uh, when Bo Calloway was here, the Republicans were up there and the Democrats were down here. Uh, it's really changed a lot. We actually have full-time residences in Mount Crested Butte now that we didn't have historically. So we're up to 805 people. So it's not bad. But I think there are things like um, the whatever event. Uh, we came together afterwards with a half a million dollars to share between the two of us and the two communities work together and work through that on where that money should best be spent to the benefit of the citizens of both communities. Happened to be that the money's down here uh, for a lot of good projects and but one of the projects that excited me was we finally finished the recreation path and we're going to get that path paved from the bridge to Elk Avenue, which is something I've been working on since the early 90s. So it's good. We can make it. Wheels of government turn slow sometimes. So uh, we have other projects uh, that are going on, like the Center for the Arts project and the Mount Crested Butte Performing Arts Center, which is really the Mount Crested Butte Event Center. Because up there, we've looked at this building, a 500-seat facility, that has to be more than just a performance hall or it's not going to be sustainable. So in order to do that, we, we have created a flexible building that will act both as a conference center 
and a place to do other events like hold classes, things like that, and also a great performance hall. But at the same time, the Center for the Arts and the rest of the arts, besides just theater type performances or performances with a stage, there's visual arts and things like that that need more space. Well, the site we have up there and the amount of money we've been able to generate so far won't support anything beyond the building that we have. So what's going on down here with the Center for the Arts is a great project for the community. And we're work, both boards are working together to make these two facilities come together and work for the future. So I think we're in a good place. We have not had a joint council meeting for a couple of years now, and we're overdue for it. And I know we'll have one this summer, or at least maybe it'll get pushed now because summer gets so busy, it may get pushed till the fall. But we'll have one in 2015, just to make sure that the councils are talking to each other and that we can keep going forward together. It, it was very difficult and very frustrating for the Mount Crested Butte Town Council to watch the Snodgrass battle evolve and not see our sister community realize that we are a ski town and we're complementary ski towns. Part of the product that we offer beyond skiing is this community, this historical community and all the restaurants and shops that are here and that, e that little extra piece of jumping on a free bus coming downtown to experience an evening or afternoon down here shopping is part of why people come here. And so we need to work together and we are. We're, our staffs communicate and uh, I think the councils are communicating better than they have. Thanks, Joel. Uh, one more question. I wanted to ask Jim, changing the subject here and covering hopefully everything. Uh, Jim, give us a status of the uh, mine, the molybdenum mine. We haven't heard a bunch of the stuff for that for a while. Uh, one of the things I've heard is that they're willing to give up their claims if we run the treatment plant, but I don't think that's a very viable option. Bring us up to date on what the status is of all of that right now. Okay, um, you're right. Um, there have been two big major things that have framed the community for the last, well, since I've been here, I got here in 76, and that has been the mine battle and the snodgrass um, stuff. And, and actually, I had written up some stuff more about a historical perspective, but as far as what, what's happening with the mine right now, as you know, a company by the name of U.S. Energy owns the property they are not a hard rock mining company. They're an oil and gas company, and not a very big one at that. They're out of Wyoming. They uh, have partnered up over the years, first with AMAX. AMAX was sold to Cyrus, uh, so they partner partnered up with Cyrus. Cyrus sold to Phelps Dodge. They partnered up with Phelps Dodge. Phelps Dodge dropped out. They found a Canadian company called Kobex. They dropped out after a couple years, and then Thompson Creek came in and they were the last company and they dropped out probably close to three years ago now. Um, after that, basically, US Energy, as I say, doesn't mine anything, so they need a partner to mine. They've tried to find somebody else to come in. They um, said they're gonna go to China and try to find out, find somebody else to come in. They're not being very successful about it over the last few years, there's been conversations with the town, with HICA, with um, the Red Lady uh, Coalition. Um, is that the right name, John? Red Lady? No, Red Lady Coalition. Yeah. Uh, about, you know, can we buy the mine? Can we buy the property? Can there be a uh, Forest Service trade with it? A lot of things were looked at and U.S. Energy came, the big stumbling block is this water treatment plant that costs between a million five and two million dollars a year to operate. Uh, and it's producing nothing, you know, it's money out of their pockets. And they have to run it. Uh, the government's making them run it. So even if they gave the mine to us today, there'd be a good question of 
you know, here, take the mine, you got the whole thing. How do we run, where do we get the extra $2 million a year to run this? Um, you know, would the people of this town go in for a mill levy to support something at that, that rate? How big, of a, how big would the district be? Would it include Mount Crest of Butte? CB South, would it go down Ohio Creek Valley? Now, the Ohio, people in Ohio Creek Valley didn't even want a bed and breakfast to expand from four rooms to eight rooms down there. I can't imagine they want a whole bunch of uh, mining trucks from a mill to be running up and down Ohio Creek. Um, so it, it kind of uh, is stuck there. Um, going back to the history of it, basically when I got here, and I will say my first job was working for Boyles Brothers Drilling, who was uh, uh, doing exploratory drilling on, to find the ore body, the Molly ore body on uh, Red Lady Mountain. Uh, that was my very first job. I worked for about four months in uh, 1976. Um, you know, immediately there was a lot of problems with that. The town council and government had felt that uh, a mine wasn't appropriate. There are many problems with the Molly mine uh, that are not just environmental, and the environmental problems are huge. If anybody's driven by Leadville and the Climax mine and seen the huge tailings pond up there and what's left of Bartlett Mountain, and there's not much left of Bartlett Mountain, but it's been, that mine's been open since the 20s, I believe. Um, so there's a out and out straight uh, environmental problems. Um, I remember a few years ago we had a gentleman that was talking about new mines developed in the United States in the last 10 years or so. They said 80% of them did not meet their water quality that they had promised. You know, they go in and say we have all this technology and we're going to clean things up. And they say, oh well, we tried. And then they try again. It just doesn't work all the time. Jim, doesn't is U.S. Energy bound by law to continue running that treatment plant? Yes, as long as they have. And, and the treatment plant itself is on um, uh, U.S. Forest Service property, I believe, or part of it is. Um, so there is a com combination of some private land up there and unpatented mining claims that are on Forest Service. So... Um, you know, both of them, uh, you know, the mine's dealing with both of, both of them. You know, and it's gone up and down. Um, I think, you know, the way I look at it, and I always ask people, I, I, I drive a lot of people up who are in the metals business and that, and they say the, the Molly market is just too volatile. Nobody can really come in here and get something going without it going down again and having things um, go bad. And there's and the other thing is that this community doesn't, I would say that is a thing that the community is probably opposed to a mine by, I don't know, I'm guessing 80, 90% of the population at this end of the valley anyhow, maybe more than that. Um, so, the, you know, we're going to throw up every roadblock there is possible. If they want to put a mine in Nevada or eastern Utah uh, or western Utah, they'll probably say, you know, come on in here and, um, you know, we'll take it. You know, Molly can be, uh, the old copper mines, the tailings of the old copper mines have a lot of Molly in them, so they can reprocess the ta tailings there. There doesn't seem to be any potential right now of the market changing. Um, is there going to be a new use of Mali? It, it seems like the world's turning to plastics, not metals, so. Jim, uh, stay there and I'm going to come back to a question. I'm just going to relate something to, to everybody. In the middle 70s, I was working on a book with Duane Smith on the Western Slope. And I had a chance to interview Stan Dempsey from the Amax company up by Leadville. And uh, prior to that time, the Amax mine on Bartlett Mountain turned out 72% of the world's supply of molybdenum. And the price went to $32 a unit. And Stan Dempsey told me that 
It's our own fault. We got greedy. Let that price go up that high. Molybdenum is not a dear metal. There's a lot of it. It's a byproduct of almost every mine, you're, every, every precious metal mine you're going to have. And when the price got to 32, every mine in the world said, at that price, <laughs> we're not going to throw it off in the dump, we'll mine it. And the price went to two from 32. And molybdenum is not a dear metal. There's a lot of it. So the chances, in my opinion, of any mine going into Crested Butte are, are as I always tell my students, slim and none, mm -hmm. and slim just left town. I don't think that's going to happen. I Enough said. Questions of any of the four? Let's go. Come on. Got another question over here. <laughs> yeah, I just have a general question about um, taxes and guns in town. Um, I know, um, I don't know the answer to this, although we've been talking. I know a lot of the property values, a lot of the taxes go down in Gunnison County. They're the county seat. They decide what happens with the money. In light of us trying to increase our infrastructure up here so that we can make our product better, so that the A gets, so it gets bigger up here, so more tourists come here. I just wonder, from your standpoint, are we getting a fair shake, you know, in our amount of taxes that are allocated countywide, Crested View, as compared to Gunnison? Because I've seen the paper, you know, we're picking away, now we have another tax increase possibly for the town parks. You know, are we going after the wrong thing? Should we try to be going after the bigger pie down in Gunnison? Uh, I think it's going to be a fight. It has been a fight. Uh, anybody who's been around here for a while, George and Bobby and Sam and Nan, know what a fight it has been about the school in this building. And that, uh, you know, shortly after we got here, they closed down the junior high up here and sent the junior high kids down to Gunnison for uh, five or six or ten years or something like that. Um, we actually talked about splitting the school district and coming up here. Problem is, they have the population down there. I mean, I've looked over the years and said, boy, that's a really nice county rodeo grounds they have down there. And what have they put up anything comparable at this end of the valley? Probably not. Um, you know, we have this strange thing, the Metro Rec District, which was uh, formed for that uh, major recreation activity of watching television. and. Um, you know, the taxes go into that, and though it's pretty minuscule uh, how much of the mill levy goes into that, it is controlled by a board that I believe is four members out of Gunnison and one member from up here. Um, so $64 question, Jim, boil it down. Is Crested Butte in the north end of the valley getting a fair shake on the taxes or not? Um, I guess we've learned to live with it, <laughs> you know. I guess we've learned to live, you know, before we used to get secondhand uniforms for the, high school, for the junior high kids and stuff like that. I, I think it is much better now. Um, people will never, you know, if you take a thing like they want to um, uh, put the chambers together for a while and have one chamber for the whole county, you just take your external fights and make them internal fights. And of course, that's always been, John can probably tell you the problem with the TA is people felt very territorial about where the TA money should go, whether, you know, from the very beginning, whether it should be called the Crested Butte Gunnison Tourism Association or Gunnison Crested Butte. Joe, you want to? Approximately 5,000 people now live in the north end of the valley. Mm -hmm. 5,000. Uh, the whole county is 14,000. 5,000 in the north end of the valley, and the biggest tax base is obviously in the north end of the valley, and especially if you include the biggest taxpayer in the Gunnison country, which now we're going to lose, which is the Somerset coal mining operation. So that's going to be a problem. Uh, I want to ask John a question. You mentioned the Tourist Association. John, um, what changes have you made in the Tourist Association, and are you satisfied that it is now going in the right direction? Stand up. Well, I think it's going in a really good direction, uh, Dwayne. Thanks for asking. The, the, uh, 
the biggest change is we're not spending money on a bunch of general stuff. And, and by that I mean, uh, you know, Condé Nast Traveler calls me and says, you know, we're, we're holding your space in that July and August issue. And, and Town and Country calls and says the same thing. And Architectural Digest. And, you know, I tell these people, you're not us and we're not you. And, and we're not going with you. And, and so, I'll just give you a brief rundown of, of kind of the, the steps we're taking. One, we're going to support the airport. The old TA didn't do that, and the new TA is going to. And we cannot just let the RTA hang out there with big guarantees. By the way, when we pay a guarantee to the airline, they are not happy. Okay, it's a, it's a double loss. You know, we're failing and they're unhappy financially. So we're gonna support the airlines. We did that this winter very successfully. We had some good programs go. So that's one. Two, we're gonna be available to the touring customer, which is so big in the summertime. This is a person that's, that's going to visit their cousins in Denver for a couple nights, and then they're gonna drive around the state and just look at things. They're not gonna bag a peak, they're not gonna catch a rainbow, they're not going to kayak the Arkansas. They're not going to mountain bike. They're just going to look at things. That's their recreation. And we're going to have brochures for them and maps for them and how to get here. And it's a nice place to hang out. Um, you know, three is the mountain biking. And, uh, you know, I'll repeat probably what you've, your understanding is already. Mountain biking has more participants than alpine skiing, and the hard goods spending is just below alpine skiing. That's a lot of money. 25% of mountain bikers have flown with their bike. I'm not talking about a jump. I'm talking about boxing up their bike and putting it on a United flight or an American flight and shipping it somewhere. And that's an expensive proposition, but when you spend six or $8,000 on your carbon mountain bike, and you're going on a mountain bike vacation, yeah, you want that bike with you. I get it. 25% of the mountain bikers. And so, and we have 750 miles of trails. Moab has 300. Okay? Now, those stickers I passed out, that site went live uh, today. MTB, we bought this uh, website address for 400 bucks from a guy in Detroit. Mountainbikehome.com, mtbhome.com, which I think is great. And so we're going to repeat the theme of come home. Hey, all you mountain bikers, come to the home. Come home for mountain biking. And I think we're going to knock a home run on this. On the, now you can download maps onto your smartphone, and the, the phone will take you to the trailhead. Have you ever tried to tell someone how to get to the dike trail? Okay? Well, and you go up, and if you look hard to your left, it's wrong to say we have terrible signage because that implies we have signage that's not good. We just don't have anything. And so this, this smartphone app is going to have all 40 different trails. And so you want to do Reno Flag Bear? It's going to take you right to the trailhead, and it's going to take you up Reno. And when you get to Flag, you're going to know that you should turn right instead of left and it's going to take you down dead man's, and you'll always know where you are, and you won't get lost again. Anyway, I think the mountain biking is going to be a hit. We're leaving tomorrow for the first ever uh, Denver Bike Expo, and we're with uh, Western, and Dave Weens is going to be there with some of his Western kids and coaches, and we're going to be there with Simba and Gunnison Trails. We've got three booths, uh, and we've got 33,000 of those stickers. 22 of the small ones, which you have, and, and 11,000 of the big ones. And, uh, you know, our purpose and, and our backdrop is just going to be 750 miles of trails. We're going to have a giant trail map of the mountain bike trails in Gunnison Valley behind us and say, download the app onto your phone, come here. And when people turn on the app, we've gotten a bunch of lodging offers 
to give to people and retail offers. So 20% off if you show the app when you check in. CBMR is giving free downhill tickets if you come in June. And so I, I think this is all going to work. And by the way, we have the largest, now we are hosting the largest mountain bike event in the United States at uh, the end of July and the beginning of August. It's the Enduro World Series. It's going New Zealand, Whistler, Crested Butte, Scotland, Wales, France, Italy. And we expect 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people here. And many of them will be here for 10 days. So this is not like the road race coming through here for a night or ride the Rockies maybe for two nights. These guys are racing Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and they're arriving Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the week before to stay all the way through. And then we're going to film probably the best riders in the world out at Hartman's on 401. We're getting some of the teams to stay. So anyway, I think this, this mountain bike stuff is really going to be fun and really work. And, and then we're, you know, we're doing some other stuff. The one thing we need, and we've got a proposal in front of CBMR, we do not have an 800 number for the Valley. It's 2015. Aspen's got one. Vale's got one. Breck's got one. Copper's got one. Keystone's got one. Telluride's got one. Jass's got one. Steamboat's got one. Sun Valley's got one. Taos has one. We have one 800 number that Crested Butte, the, the Skiria owns, and they book their own properties. And that's it. And the Nordic Inn. And uh, Westwall. And it's nuts. So as we put together some promotions for people to, to call and book, we don't, we don't have a number to give. Because we're the TA. We're not just selling the ski area. We're trying to sell everybody. We can't, you know, the Gunnison Getaway, uh, we used to do 15,000 skier days out of Gunnison in, in the winter, in the late 80s. And this year we did eight. Yeah, that's a big decline. Not 8,000, eight. We don't have a number. We don't have a, the ability to book. And so we've got a proposal into CBMR that we'd like to pay some startup costs, pay a share of the phone calls that we're able to generate, train some people to book the whole valley. I expect that, you know, I, I, I'm hoping for a positive answer because there's, we can't, we're a teeny little TA and there's no way we can start our own reservation service for the valley. It's just not going to happen. So that's what we're doing. And I think that's going to be good. And then we'll, we'll figure out when or when we get there. Question, question behind you there. Oh, yes, I've heard a lot about the recreation of our valley up here, but what about the ranching community? And how sustainable is that? And where is the ranching community going to be in 10 or 20 years, 30 years from now? I'll tell you what. Uh, let me have that microphone, John. I'm going to walk it right over to John Rosman, who's going to stand up. John Rosman, one of the most prominent members, he's going to stand up and uh, perhaps tell a little bit. Yeah, come on, John, you're on, buddy. Uh, talk a little bit about the ranching community and some of the challenges uh, that we have maybe in the ranching community. Well, to begin with, it's a good country to ranch in but it's expensive. I mean, basically, I don't think I raised cows, I raised a bale of hay. I fed the last bale and I started growing the next one. Uh, and a lot of things have changed in the ranching community. At one time, I could open my gate down here and the cows would mosey up to here. The last time I come down through Gothic 20 years ago, uh, I was bringing down some, some cows, bull, down the center, uh, down the center of Gothic, down the main street. There was nobody. Now you can't even drive up there. 401 Trail. I was on 401 Trail driving cattle, never saw anybody. So you. You have to work it out. A uh, lot of the, how do I want to put it? Uh, it's a, 
I think in the overall scheme of things, to support the people, it's more of an individual. Uh, you, you're a small group where, you know, we don't bring in the people for the restaurants and we don't bring in the people for this and we don't bring in the people for that. Uh, so it's a sustainable, but it isn't, it's a small part of the big picture, what you're looking at, especially what John was telling us, you know, or Jim or, or Joe. There's a big picture, and ranching is right now just a small part of it. And, uh, and it'll, ma it'll maintain itself. Uh, on my part, I, I, don't, I didn't like to see the development. I put, I put my place in a conservancy. Nobody, you know, they can't build there. The Rosman Hill, you can't build a house on top of that hill anymore. I had ground that would have bordered the Forest Service. I'd hate to put a price on it. But I was, you know, I was born and raised here. In other words, Monday will be 75 years I entered this county. So I've been here a long time. And before that, it was my parents, and before that, it was my grandparents. So we, we have a, I have a special attraction for it. And ranching helps sustain it. Thank you. One of the things, uh, before I pass the microphone back, uh, you know what I have told the stock growers many times, and I think John has probably heard me say it, that all of you in this room and everybody living in the valley have to understand that the best environmentalists in the Gunnison country are the ranchers. They want to they start selling. John Rosman, I don't know, you know, he'd be worth millions tomorrow if he wanted to sell. And the other thing is their water rights will beat any investment on the New York Stock Exchange, any investment on the New York Stock Exchange as the years go on. Not even close. So when you think about ranching, it may be small, a small pie in the big pie, but it may be the most important pie in the big pie. Let's pass that over to Joe and, and Chris. Chris, I got a qu quick question for you, and I'm going to sit down and shut up and let everybody else answer. <laughs> uh, I read in the paper today that it's a terrific thing to be able to get a place to stay if you are uh, uh, just a regular laborer in Crested Butte. We seem to have difficulty with people finding a place to live, and some of them are talking about going down Valley to Gunnison. What is Crested Butte doing to address this housing problem? Uh, that's, a, that's a big one. And I, th I think you're right. It is something that we keep hearing. I, I know I felt it personally uh, with our own employees. We hear it in the council, and I think it's growing in intensity. And it is probably one of the big issues facing our community up here, which is going to make the, uh, the fact of getting along with Mount Crested Butte seemingly trivial to the fact that we have to think as a valley and while we think of Gunnison as what was once our airport and a gateway to the north end of the valley, it is now perhaps where a third of our employees will live during the summertime, if we're lucky to get enough employees to operate as many shifts as we would like. Uh, I, th I think you have to hit it from a number of directions. One is you have to try to stem the decrease in supply. And there's been, over the last 20 years, a steady erosion of low-cost housing as homes are um, remodeled, as real estate prices rise, as demand for employees increases and therefore rents go up, um, and some decreased supply to 
the fact that visitors like to stay in homes and you can make money in July and August renting your home, perhaps enough to make you willing as, an, as a homeowner to take your home off the long-term market. Um, that's why I was a strong proponent of a late night bus going back uh, with the RTA from the north end of the valley to Gunnison, which was initially met with a great deal of apprehension. The RTA was concerned that it might be one of the dog routes and there wouldn't be enough people. And it is consistently performing well above average in its very first season and has been extended to summer, which shows there was this pent up demand for people to transport to Gunnison, um, which is not a trend that will go away. So I expect that Gunnison will be a huge factor to our ability to be successful and will perhaps be a part of the question. It's not as simple as where the tax base is driven, but how our real estate values are supported and our tourist infrastructure can be sustained is driven largely by our ability to staff employees. And that is a valley-wide footprint. So uh, I think transportation is one, thinking more broadly than just north end of the valley versus south. I think we will have to entertain some type of um, mechanism, whether it's municipal driven or public-private partnerships to expand supply of affordable housing. And uh, I think that's something that nobody's gonna feel good about, but we're going to have to strike a compromise. So there will have to be some way to manage that and encourage and incentivize more development of places for people to live. But Gunnison will be a big part of the solution. I, I believe so. And I, I think that Gunnison recognizes it, and they were a participant in the RTA uh, expansion of the route. And I think that the employers of those who do not earn a large income at the north end of the valley are seeing it first. And that will have a a domino effect and we'll see it more. We haven't yet seen the increase in rents for businesses that will follow the increase in real estate and the pressure on wages that will go up as you have to pay more for someone to commute essentially and devote an extra hour of their day to work a low income job. So now wages will go up, real estate prices and rents will have this natural lag and I am not looking forward to the next time we have to negotiate our leases as a business. And I think over the next 10 years, you're gonna see a lot more businesses sharing space, using smaller spaces, but inevitably the cost of things is going to rise. Other questions, folks? Here's your opportunity. Go ahead. Chris, to follow up on that looking out 10 years, and I'm sure the council looks out 10 years or more, uh, the population between 2000 and 2010 have grown all the rest of you permanent residents. Do you see the permanent residents, the people who live here, actually increasing or will it continue to decrease? I, I don't know that I have the answer. My suspicion is that we won't see a huge increase. We have a finite amount of land. What we may see is perhaps a trend where a certain segment of the population, certain demographics can actually afford to compete in the, this real estate market and they may move here. So then the person who rents the, out their home July, August, September and it sits vacant for eight months will go ahead and lease it to a family who has the ability to supplement their income and work both in the valley and draw on business elsewhere. So. I, I see maybe a modest increase in the employee, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the residents, uh, but I fear for how many employees can actually afford to make the, uh, fulfill those lower earning jobs and afford to live at this end of the valley. Joel, uh, along that line, what, what, uh, what do you see up in Mount Crest to Butte right now with respect to prospect, real estate sales, how's that doing? Well, first of all, um, after 2008, the 
assessed value in Mount Crested Butte dropped over 50 percent. And I think Crested Butte may have seen a similar drop, but it didn't drop as much down here uh, as, we, as we saw. So that, that's an impact. But, but Mount Crested Butte um, generates housing dollars to build affordable housing when there is development. So there's some interesting things going on in the second home market. Um, and you talk to a lot of major second home developers and they will suggest that projects like uh, the Lodge at Mountaineer Square are not going to happen anymore. Um, and that in order to create a demand for second homes, they'll be smaller, second home like a condominium, they'll be smaller and they'll be smaller projects. There's still a demand in Mount Crested Butte for a single family home, but those single family homes like up in Prospect are anywhere from five to 8,000 square feet, but they generate a lot of jobs. And those jobs need employees and employees have to have a place to live. I'm gonna digress a little bit because there's interesting things going on in the Valley right now. Western State Colorado University is on a push and a drive to grow, increase the number of students. As they do that, that is going to put pressure on housing demand in Gunnison. So all of a sudden, we're going to be competing within the valley for the limited housing that's available right now. As we have more of a need for employees up here, they can't find a place up here, they're going to go down the valley and all of a sudden it's going to get more difficult to find housing in Gunnison. So there's a project in Mount Crested Butte that used to be known as Marcelina Apartments. It is now called the Timbers. It's being total, the building is totally gutted. They're going to reconstruct it and they will be small units. Uh, there are only seven deed restricted units in the building. They will remain deed restricted units, but the rest of that building is going to go on the free market, but at a price point that may be affordable for uh, somebody that wants to live here, for a, a local person. So uh, we're, we continue have to have this balance in, in trying to find housing. Mount Crested Butte has a small fund that, that isn't growing right now because there isn't any major construction going on up there. Uh, Crest Butte is spending some money, some of the whatever money, to help develop the infrastructure down here for one or two blocks. I don't remember, two blocks, yeah, for two blocks in, in Crest Butte to put in infrastructure for affordable housing. But I don't think they have a lot of money laying around to actually build it. So that, that's a continuing battle. Um, I, to throw one other thing in, it's important to note that when you look at up valley and down valley, the RTA bus system and airline support is, is supported by the whole valley. And so there's a great opportunity for all of us that live here and that want to preserve what we can preserve, but still, if we aren't growing, we're dying. And I agree with John, we're still dying. We're not growing as far as the major businesses the One Valley Prosperity Project, if you haven't paid attention to it, take a look at it, get on the website. Lauren can give us the website. Take a look at it, because I don't remember what it is. <laughs> OneValleyProsperity.com. Take a look at it. Get your input into this effort. This is a major county-wide effort to try to draw out of people what are the real deep-seated values that we all have? Why does Dwayne love to live here? Why did he know way back in the 60s why he really wanted to stay here? My wife and I came here in 1978. We knew we wanted to stay. Uh, so the One Valley Prosperity Project is trying to draw that out and turn that effort into, okay, how do we shape our future for this entire valley by using those values 
and guiding our elected officials and, and the leadership in the, in the valley to preserving as much as we can preserve as we need to preserve and want to preserve, yet still keep our economy on a sustainable track. So jump into it. One Valley Prosperity Project. housing um, it's been frustrating on housing over the years I've been on council since 1981 and every year that is our number one uh, problem of you know how to solve the housing problem and it's, and it's not getting any better and every time somebody talks whether it's the school expanding or a mine coming in can you imagine the pressure on the housing if a mine came in and was employing 1500 people during their build up where do the houses go where do the low income workers go they go up up there but it, it has been frustrating um, and Joe mentioned the Marcelina uh, condo thing that was 44 units I believe 44 originally that was supposedly affordable housing, and then it became nothing and lost that. This, some stuff out at Skyland, um, you know, the town of Crested Butte pushed hard to make certain units out there affordable, and they were restricted for the first round, but after uh, one owner, then it opened up. Anytime you do affordable housing, you... We have watched the other communities in Colorado. Aspen is way ahead of everybody else. They have like 5,000 units of affordable housing of all kinds. Some of their affordable housing is $500,000. Some of their for sale, and it's probably even more than that, but that's the only way a doctor or a lawyer who lives in Aspen can afford to live in Aspen to get that type of affordable housing. We are behind the curve. We watch what other people do. It's, it's frustrating because you go in and, in, for instance, in uh, Virgin Annexation, uh, some of the affordable housing, you know, people cheated on it and went and just made it so difficult to keep it into affordable housing. And um, that, that's a frustrating thing. Um, I'm really pleased with uh, Carl Fulmer, who's the new head of the housing in uh, Gunnison County. He is a real professional and is bringing a lot of good stuff to the county. Um, you know, a lot of criticism about Anthracite Place that's going to start in less than a month. Um, but we need it. It might not be the world's best location, but we need it. And even when it's done, we're going to need more. Um, and every, everything we look at, um, you know, every time there's a development, we look at some extraction for affordable housing. It doesn't always work. Rick? And then the 3% transfer tax can use for converted to open space any other The real estate transfer tax, because the um, Tabor Amendment, which passed uh, about 15 years ago now, by the way, the guy Tabor, Doug Bruce, is <laughs> going to jail for many, many things. Wonderful guy that uh, led the state into passing that. Um, because they, it precludes any new uh, real estate transfer tax, it is, everybody is afraid to change their original language on a real estate transfer tax that, um, that it might, you know, it might be deemed a new tax. Unfortunately, Mount Crested Butte uh, their tax was voted at six votes, Joe? Sure. Seven votes. So uh, that's when they proposed a real estate transfer tax in 85, 90? Somewhere around there. Just before Tabor went in. Sorry to jump up and make noise. Um, just one quick thing. We're about out of time here. Um, about four or five years ago, uh, John Stevens, a good friend of mine, and you know, John knows him very well, uh, I've known John for 50 years since I gave a high school commencement of his in Telluride in 1964. And he was the CEO of Telluride, and I was there with my San Juan class, and Cliff Diamond from Steamboat Springs was in town, who I'd never met. And uh, he and I and John had lunch, and both of those guys said that 
the number one problem in ski areas in the future is going to be how do you get workers? In Telluride, they were bringing them in from the Navajo Indian Reservation in Arizona. And they stay for about three days and then they take them back. So that's a terrific, terrific problem. And it obviously deals with a lot of affordable housing. Uh, any questions before we uh, want to leave? If not, John, Joe, Jim, Chris, let's give them a nice round of applause. Great job. Great job. Before we go, Lauren, give the uh, website again, which everybody needs to get on and uh, take a hit. OneValleyProsperity.com. And there are cookies on the table to be taken. Don't leave any. Who brought those cookies anyway? You brought them. Booth brought them. Give Booth a nice round of applause. Grab a cookie. <laughs>